We're going to switch gear a little bit. So you've uh, just reviewed a lot of murmurs, hemodynamics, and uh, let's uh, spend uh, the next 45 minutes on some uh, cardiac electrophysiologic related uh, issues. I'm going to go straight to the point and uh, highlight some of the areas I think uh, that will be key for you to know and to remember uh, for the boards. We, what we have decided to do is to divide the electrophysiologic component for the internal medicine board review into two. What I will be doing that uh, will be on the three areas related to mechanisms, diagnostic testing indications and contraindications, as well as therapeutics. And uh, Dr. Friedman, at the end of the day, will go through the specific arrhythmia diagnoses, bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias, looking at those ECGs and interpretations. So let's go straight to, to the mechanisms. And uh, I only have three slides for you to remember. And uh, when it comes to cardiac uh, arrhythmia mechanisms, it is key to remember that uh, there are three mechanisms that traditionally have been divided uh, into reentry, automaticity, and triggered. Reentry probably is the most frequent mechanism for most of the clinical arrhythmias, and it's being estimated about 80 to 90 percent of the clinical arrhythmias is due to a reentry mechanism. On this slide, what I wanted to highlight for you to remember is that a reentry is an arrhythmogenic mechanism while the arrhythmia can be anatomically located in just about any portion of the heart. So reentry tachyarrhythmia can occur in the sinus node, can occur in the atrium, can occur around the AV node, which the AV nodal reentry tachycardia is the most frequent supraventricular tachyarrhythmia. And reentry tachyarrhythmia can use the accessory pathway, as we know in patients with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and this is the second most common supraventricular arrhythmia. And while ventricular tachycardia also can be reentrant in mechanism. In addition to the reentry mechanism, that uh, there is automaticity and triggered activity. It is key to remember that normal sinus rhythm is caused or is underlied by the automatic mechanism, while there are other clinical arrhythmias like ectopic atrial tachycardia is most likely caused by an abnormal automaticity and accelerated ventricular rhythm. While triggered activity, the most important one to keep in mind is to a certain point in patients with prolonged QT syndrome. And finally, that uh, when it comes to uh, mechanisms, although this particular correlation, I doubt very much that you're going to see any questions on the boards, but by remember this relationship, which I will spend a minute to go over this, is that it's going to be a key to understand that uh, the mechanisms of arrhythmias and also how pharmacological agents work and when it comes to question related to the various antiarrhythmic agents and what their effects on the ECG and uh, this is really one of the pictures you should remember. On the top is the action potential duration. On the bottom is the surface lead electrocardiogram correlating to a cardiac cycle. What I will focus just on the top of the action potential, which is, is, the, is shaped into the ventricular or atrial tissue electrophysiology or the action potential for the atrial and ventricular tissue, not the nodal tissue. But if you look at the correlation from the top to the bottom, is that the phase zero of the action potential correlates to the QR, QRS complex on the surface lead. The action potential duration correlates to the QT interval. Therefore, any pharmacological agent that affects phase zero of the action potential, which is sodium channel dependent, 
these are class one drug, antiarrhythmic drugs. Their clinical manifestation will be on the prolongation of the QRS duration. Any drugs, particularly antiarrhythmic drug class three, these are potassium channel blockers. They prolong action potential duration and therefore on the surface lead, their effect will be on the prolongation of the QT interval. So if you remember this picture, keeping in mind phase zero to the QRS complex, phase zero is sodium dependent mostly, and uh, while the action potential duration correlates to the QT interval, and uh, the repolarization or the action potential duration is very much potassium channel dependent, and therefore class three agents that affect the QT interval. Now let's go to the diagnostic testing. I have listed all of the cardio, uh, cardiac diagnostic studies for arrhythmias, but uh, the ones in green, and uh, I will highlight a few points I think will be keys to remember. Holter monitor, it is used for diagnosis as everyone is familiar with, and, but it has to be utilized in an appropriate fashion that uh, patients on the boards related to the, 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 thinking about the potential utility of a Holter monitor, that these are the patients usually should have frequent episodes of symptoms that could be correlated to the arrhythmias and usually daily. And the uh, utilization for the pacemaker could be thought could be in the area of pacemaker function and the T wave, the ST segment elevation for some of the Holter monitors can be assessed for ischemia. And most importantly, to correlate the symptoms that patient is, patients are telling you to the arrhythmias that's documented that on the Holter monitor. And uh, as far as on the therapeutic uh, area for Holter monitor, atrial fibrillation rate control and PVC suppression. Ambulatory event recorders, again for diagnostic purposes, keeping in mind that uh, this particular type of diagnostic modality will be most effective in those patients with transient infrequent events. So that if there should be a question related to the selection of a halter versus an event, report, uh, event recorder, the key to differentiate the selection of these two devices will be the frequency of the symptoms that the patients are telling you. And again, that it will be a key that to correlate the symptoms to the arrhythmias documented on the event recording. A new area that uh, for the event recorders, now they are implantable recorders and uh, the portable, uh, and these implantable recorders, again, that uh, to perhaps most effectively that uh, in utilizing the, the devices that uh, the portable recorders and usually are given to the patients for no more than one to two months in duration, while the implantable recorders battery life will last up to about a year and a half in duration. So the selection of these two devices that will be the, the frequency of the symptoms uh, that uh, if indeed a person is telling you that uh, he or she has a transient symptoms potentially related to arrhythmias uh, but occurring on a weekly basis will be too infrequent for Holter, but that certainly is in the range of a portable event recorder and that certainly that would be the key for you to decide to use this particular diagnostic tool. While if another patient presenting with an episode or two episodes every six months or every year and that's the time that the implantable recorder should be considered. How about tilt table testing? Tilt table testing, that's, uh, although that's, uh, the specific guidelines have not been put for, uh, forth uh, by the various committees, but suggestions with regard to the tilt table testing that have been made and when this should be utilized. I think it is important to remember that if a person has recurrent syncope or a single episode of syncope in a high-risk patient, 
whether or not the medical history is suggestive of newly mediated origin, meaning that that these so in other words that tilt table testing is indicated if a person has recurrent syncope and or if a person has had a single episode of uh, syncope but belongs to the high risk group and uh, for instance how is this defined? No evidence of structural heart disease and structural, heart, uh, structural cardiovascular disease present but other causes of syncope have been excluded by appropriate testing. So in those patients that uh, without any structural heart disease if the person has had recurrent syncope, tilt table testing is indicated. If a person that has had a single episode of syncope in the setting of a structural heart disease, but no other diagnosis has been established, that tilt table testing that should be considered. How about contraindications for tilt table testing? And this is also an area that I think it's important to remember for the boards as well as for clinical practice. The tilt table testing is not recommended if a single episode without injury, not in a high risk setting, and with symptoms are clearly consistent with the vasovagal syncope. These are the patients that you see, the young patients without any underlying heart disease reports to your office with a classic presentation of vasovagal syncope has happened once. It never it was not associated so with any injury and patients spontaneously recovered. That particular patient does not need a tilt table testing because that the clinical diagnosis can be established by taking a thorough history and uh, also some preliminary laboratory testing to exclude underlying disease. And tilt table testing is not indicating in those patients with syncope that in which an alternative specific cause has been established. So in other words, let's say a person that, uh, who has uh, had uh, recurrent syncope that uh, with a pause has been documented correlated to the spells. That particular patient that does not require a tilt table testing to uh, establish any other diagnoses. And uh, uh, also that uh, uh, if uh, the information that from the tilt table testing will not alter any treatment plans and therefore that tilt table testing is not uh, recommended. Then let's take a look at the electrophysiologic testing. I think this is where that uh, some of the key indications and contraindications should be remembered. For diagnostic purposes, electrophysiologic study today is indicated when syncope, for syncope evaluation in those patients with underlying heart disease. And in those patients with uh, narrow and or wide complex tachycardia, and in those patients that uh, will have had a history of sudden cardiac death. For prognostic purposes, that in those patients with non-sustained ventricular tachycardia with compromised ejection fraction, today I would define for those patients with ejection fraction less than 40% following a myocardial infarction. Now here is something that I think it's important to remember. For prognostic purposes, that the EP study is indicated in patients with non-sustained VT after myocardial infarction with compromised ejection fraction. EP study is not indicated for prognostic purposes in patients with non-ischemic heart disease. I think that's extremely important to remember. The reason being is that it is the findings are not specific or sensitive enough in those patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or in non-ischemic uh, myopathies. And therapy, that EP study is indicated with, for those areas that EP guidance is required and uh, for reproducibility of SVT, VT, as we will review that uh, the areas that uh, for ablation, which is uh, a very much evolving area today. Uh, let's go straight to the therapeutics for arrhythmias, bradycardia and tachycardia. Bradycardia indications, uh, as far as therapy is concerned, pacemaker is really the therapy that for all of the documented and symptomatic bradycardia, there is no drug therapy. While tachyarrhythmias that uh, we will divide into the discussion of drugs, ablation, and defibrillators.
Let's go look at indications, just a general definition when we think about indications for any type of therapeutic recommendations. Usually the indications are divided into three categories. And when you think about the questions on the board and how to answer these questions, keeping in mind that usually these questions are targeting for class one indication for implementing the therapy or class three indications and these are the situations the therapy is not recommended. And once in a while that you may get a question that with a class two indication, those are the times that uh, you will see more debate about if such a uh, therapeutic recommendation has been substantiated from large trials and such. Bradycardia, when it comes to Brady arrhythmias, that uh, the key areas to focus uh, for your review of the boards will be ECG recognition of the various evidences for sinus node dysfunction and AV block. Dr. Freeman will review that, and I will review the indications for pacemakers. And keeping in mind, the key here for indications for pacemaker implantation is correlating symptoms to documented bradyarrhythmia. Sinus node dysfunction, class one indication, meaning that uh, everybody, just about everybody agrees that pacemaker should be implanted if there is documented symptomatic bradyarrhythmia. And usually the bradyarrhythmia is defined when there is persistent sinus bradyarrhythmia at a rate less than 40 beats per minute or inappropriate exercise response if the sinus rate cannot exceed 90 beats per minute, again correlated with symptoms, and or pauses that of three seconds or more. And while class two and class three indications, class two as I said, that these are the, uh, the marginal indications and although most times clinically we probably would at least offer the pacemaker implantation as an option, for the patient's therapeutic recommendations, and let's take a look at the class three. Class three, these are the asymptomatic patients, that including those who are sub, uh, substantial sinus node bradycardia and due to drugs. Now, if a person that has, is asymptomatic with sinus rate about 40 or 35 on a beta blocker therapy, there is no indication for pacing, for prophylactic pacing that in that patient, unless that you are going to be changing the medications, increasing the dose, and those are the times, of course, that uh, additional monitoring will be required. And also sinus node when symptoms are not to be associated with bradyarrhythmia. So in other words, here you have recorded some sinus node bradyarrhythmia, but the patient is completely asymptomatic. There is no indication for pacemaker implantation. How about AV block? Class one indications. Third degree AV block, permanent or intermittent, that's associated with symptoms. Congenital AV block with white complex QIS escape. Second degree AV block, uh, permanent or intermittent type two, that regardless, uh, uh, but again, second degree AV block, if it is associated with symptoms, that pacemaker implantation is indicated. Again, I highlighted the symptoms here, that advanced second degree or third degree AV block persisting for 10 to 14 days in duration after cardiac surgery. So acquired that uh, uh, high degree AV block after surgery. And uh, the, uh, let's see, this is, uh, we will skip class two, let's go to class three. Class three, that first degree AV block, that uh, it, uh, there is no reason for uh, uh, pacemaker implantation. And in patients with asymptomatic uh, type one second degree AV block. This is one area I think uh, that uh, uh, sometimes that uh, uh, because of the data may not be as complete as some of the uh, more other types of acquired AV blocks, but following myocardial infarction, what are the indications for pacemaker implantation? 
one persistent advanced second degree AV block that, uh, that uh, meaning that the blockade occurs in the Hisperkinji system that usually these are the settings you see that patients with second degree or third degree AV block in the setting of a newly acquired bundle branch block and transient AV block and associated with bundle branch block. So these are the situations that the patient's indication for pacemaker that uh, are met. And uh, the class two indication, persistent advanced AV block at the node. So in other words, and here that you have persistent AV block after myocardial infarction, but the QRS complex is narrow. That this is an area of much debate, and uh, usually that uh, this is again a decision that made between the physician and the patient. And while class three indications, meaning that there are no indications that for pacemaker therapy after the myocardial infarction, including those patients with transient AV block, uh, that in the absence of any intraventricular conduction, they like transient episode, transient AV block in the presence of isolated hemi block, acquired left anterior hemi block in the absence of any AV block, and also persistent first degree AV block in the presence of bundle branch block but uh, not uh, in the presence of bundle branch block not demonstrated previously. So in other words, that here is a acquired first degree AV block and uh, with the bundle branch block, but in the absence of any observation of AV block, there is no indication that for pacemaker. Uh, pharmacologically, that uh, pharmacological therapy for arrhythmias and uh, areas that uh, you should be reviewing and also keeping in mind is that where are the targets for the particular drug? ECG manifestations, as we briefly touched upon, how the drugs, depending upon the target and where the ECG manifestations may appear. Interactions of drugs, complications, and proarrhythmias, and I will highlight a few key areas of all of these. Just a list, and you have uh, all of these uh, that uh, in the, in the uh, review book. A list of antiarrhythmic drugs of class one agents. The ones in green are the ones that are being used and still in the, on the market. And class one drugs, as I said, these are sodium channel blockers. And class two drugs, uh, these are beta blockers and class three drugs, and uh, again in green, these are the ones that are uh, being used, and, uh, and the class three drugs are potassium channel drugs, blockade drugs, and they prolong QT interval. And while class four drugs are calcium channel blockers, and others, other antiarrhythmic drugs that do not belong to class, classic uh, 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 classification, uh, for the antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, these would be adenosine, that's uh, digoxin, and atropine that uh, we do have available in our clinical practice. One slide just summarizing that the target for these antiarrhythmic drugs, and I would divide that uh, the organization and try to remember this by those drugs that with exclusive properties that block in the AV node as those drugs that exclusively only that have effect on the atrial and ventricular tissue and as versus those drugs that they have effect on atrial ventricular tissue plus the nodal tissue. Adenosine, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and digoxins targeting the AV node. While class one agents and class three agents that they target the atrial and ventricular tissue. So when you have an atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, that most times that we really not primarily targeting the arrhythmias with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers and adenosine because really that uh, there is not a lot of therapeutic effect in, those, in these agents that with AV node as a target for the atrial or ventricular tissue. And uh, that uh, while similarly, most of these drugs are not used, these drugs that are class one or class three are not used for rhythm disturbances or for slowing down the ventricular rate because they have minimal effects on the AV node. 
What you see on the left upper corner here are the three drugs that I listed that they can they have effects on both the nodal tissues as well as the atrial and ventricular tissues because that these drugs, propofenone a class one, amiodarone and sodalol class three, in addition to propofenone sodium channel blocker and a potassium channel blockade effect of amiodarone and sodalol, all of these three drugs have other properties. Propofenone with beta blocker effect, amiodarone as we know that it has beta blockade and calcium channel blockade effect, and sotalol has beta blockade effect. And uh, one area I think it's extremely important about drug-drug interactions and also excretion and metabolism of the antiarrhythmic drugs. And I summarized uh, the uh, uh, mode of uh, metabolism for all of these antiarrhythmic drugs. One way to remember this is that these three drugs, but pretifium, sodalol, and dofidolite, are the three drugs almost all exclusively excreted by the kidneys, while most other drugs are hepatic or a combination of the both of uh, the excretion uh, uh, modalities. So remember these drugs and most other drugs that will fall into at least partially that with a hepatic mechanism and so that uh, when it comes to uh, drug adjustment that will be important. Now when it comes to the hepatic metabolic mechanism that keeping in mind it is the cytochrome 450 system and they are interactions extremely that important when we think about using these drugs. That they are drugs that inhibits the cytochrome 450 system and therefore when somatity that is used that other drugs, uh, uh, the antiarrhythmic drugs that uh, with the liver metabolism that the dosage of these drugs that will be will need to be reduced. While that uh, if any inducers of the enzymes, usually these are the drugs uh, like rifampin, barbiturates, these drugs that enhances the cytochrome P450 system. So if an antiarrhythmic drug will be used that in conjunction with any of the enzymatic inducers, then the antiarrhythmic drug level should be followed closely because most likely that uh, the antiarrhythmic drug dosage will need to be increased. And uh, the hepatic flow, these are the conditions that inhibits that hepatic flow and therefore reduces metabolism, beta blockers and congestive heart failure. So that's why you see that patients that uh, on lidocaine in the CCU while in extreme heart failure, that lidocaine dosage has to be adjusted accordingly because metabolism is significantly reduced. Here that again some of the drugs as I listed earlier that with the metabolic um, liver metabolism. Drug interactions that quinidine and digoxin, I think everybody knows, we should remember that uh, if uh, that quinidine is used in a person who is already on digoxin, that uh, the digoxin level, digit level will increase by 100 percent. And semetidine, as I said, so that uh, it uh, inhibits the cytochrome P450 system. Therefore, any antiarrhythmic drugs that with liver metabolism, that uh, the dosages will need to be uh, adjusted. Another important interaction is amiodarone. Amiodarone increases digit level by about 75 percent, while that warfarin level that also will need to be reduced when a person starts with amiodarone level uh, with amiodarone therapy. A few of non-cardiac side effects of antiarrhythmic drugs will be important uh, for the medicine boards because that a lot of these questions trying to put that uh, questions related to systemic effects. For instance, procanamide, procanamide with the manifestations of lupus and agranulocytosis. The incidence of lupus uh, that uh, with procanamide, uh, if a person is on long-term procanamide, probably, or at least lupus-like symptoms probably will occur in about 20 percent, while agranulocytosis occur in about 1 to 3 percent. Now, provided that remembering that uh, these usually occur after prolonged drug administration and that means over six months. So clinically that even today that uh, we occasionally still use procanamide, but procanamide is used 
mostly on the short-term basis for, for instance, two to three months, not after cardiac surgery for prevention of atrial fibrillation. Quinidine, remember, thrombocytopenia, this happens about three to five percent of the time, and uh, anemia. And uh, the uh, propofenol, because of its beta blockade effect, asthma exacerbation, while we all know amiodarone with pulmonary fibrosis, hepatitis, hyper or hypothyroidism, and also photosensitivity, while sotalol, that's uh, again because of its beta blockade effect, asthma exacerbation. And uh, now, so we reviewed that uh, the uh, uh, indications for pacemaker for bradyarrhythmia. We reviewed the pharmacological key areas of pharmacological therapy, antiarrhythmic drugs regarding its, uh, their targets, metabolism, and uh, and also in interactions and the, some side effects. Now let's go on with uh, uh, other important area of uh, tachyarrhythmias that with uh, non-pharmacological therapy, where do we stand when it comes to device therapy like the defibrillator, sudden cardiac death prevention, and as well as ablative therapy. When we talk about sudden cardiac death prevention, we group the patients into two categories. Secondary, uh, the uh, primary sudden cardiac death prevention and secondary sudden cardiac death prevention. For primary sudden cardiac death prevention, these are the patients who are at higher risk for sudden cardiac death, but clinically the event has not occurred. The risk of these patients that will depend on the underlying heart disease, and uh, we will look over some of the risk stratification issues. While secondary sudden cardiac death prevention, these are the lucky patients who have survived a sudden cardiac event. They have been resuscitated and brought to the hospital under your care. And uh, these patients that most times that sudden cardiac death is, is uh, caused by VT or VF, if nothing is done on these patients, recurrence rate will in, be in the range of 20 to 40 percent per year. So these are the patients that we will need to aggressively treat and address the secondary sudden cardiac death prevention. But for the board's purposes, I think it will be easier to remember because just about that uh, any circumstances, if a person who has had a sudden cardiac event, today the uh, choice, the therapeutic choice, first choice is a defibrillator. We will look into some of the specifics. Uh, that's why I put the secondary sudden cardiac death prevention issues to review here first because I think most of the information has been completed, recommendations have been made, and uh, these are the areas that we have fairly clear-cut reasons uh, for the current guidelines. This is the uh, trial, the AVID trial, that compared ICD therapy versus conventional therapy, and majority of these patients received amiodarone for secondary sudden cardiac death prevention. These were the patients who had had, who had, had sudden cardiac death resuscitated, or these patients had documented sustained ventricular tachycardia hemodynamically unstable. And uh, with a randomized trial comparing ICD to conventional therapy, that it was clear that the defibrillator, the patients received the defibrillator had improved survival. This is total mortality that comparing to those patients that with conventional therapy, majority of those patients got amiodarone therapy. Very similarly, that uh, the study by the SIDS, that, uh, which is the Canadian randomized trial, very similar to the Abbott, was recently in CERC and uh, that the results were very similar. That uh, a German study that uh, although the final report is not available, but again with a very similar findings. So when it comes to sudden cardiac death prevention for secondary prevention purposes, that the current guidelines are such that uh, ICD 
that is effective in preventing sudden cardiac death and ICD has been shown to improve overall survival and indications including those patients with cardiac arrest due to VT, VF, but remember not due to a transient or reversible cause. And this is an area that I again very much evolving but for the board's purposes if someone who had a sudden cardiac death associated with a, or associated with a documented myocardial infarction because the fact that the sudden cardiac death the world of ventricular arrhythmia was a result of acute ischemia therefore the treatment of choice of that particular group of patients is correct their ischemia and while that ICD indication today is not established. So keeping in mind that although I have said ICD is pretty much uniformly recommended today for sudden, secondary sudden cardiac death prevention, but current guidelines suggest in only in those patients without any transient or reversible causes and uh, the acute myocardial infarction and uh, is considered as a transient event, especially afterwards you can correct the ischemia. Spontaneous sustained VT, you have documented sustained spontaneous VT, that's an indication for ICD. Syncope of undetermined origin with clinically relevant hemodynamically significant sustained VT or VF induced in the EP laboratory when drug therapy is not effective effective, not tolerated, or not preferred. So if a person had a syncopal event, you bring the patient to the EP laboratory, you induce VT. That patient fulfills the criteria for ICD implantation. So I think the secondary sudden cardiac death prevention issues, most of these issues are fairly straightforward. Treat underlying disease, at the same time ICD is the current choice for secondary sudden cardiac death prevention. How about primary sudden cardiac death prevention? This is an area very much evolving. I will show you what's available and uh, the areas that uh, we have had data now for two, three, four years. And I think some of these questions that uh, can, certainly can appear on the board. When it comes to primary sudden cardiac death prevention, antiarrhythmic drugs are out, period. 1989 CAST data, I think everybody here probably is familiar with, is that with a randomized study comparing flaconide, anconite, and mirisacin with placebo in those patients after myocardial infarction with, with non-sustained ventricular tachycardia asymptomatic, these drugs were compared to placebo. And it was very impressive that although these drugs were able to suppress the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, but every single drug under that study was associated with increased mortality as compared to placebo. So antiarrhythmic drug therapy for primary sudden cardiac death prevention is absolutely contraindicated. And that is supported by reviewing that with meta-analysis and including randomized trials, not randomized trials, uh, just about all of the trials suggest that there is no survival benefit with prophylactic antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Things get a little more uh, fuzzy when it comes to amiodarone. Amiodarone appears to be different from the rest of the antiarrhythmic drugs and uh, highlighted on the bottom two study, with the bottom two studies in this table. Amiot, which is a European amiodarone study following myocardial infarction. Camiot is the Canadian amiodarone post myocardial infarction. These are the patients with coronary artery disease with compromised ejection fraction. Amiodarone was compared to placebo looking for total mortality as well as certain cardiac death. That the primary endpoint of, from both of these studies looking at total mortality, there was no difference between amiodarone and placebo. Although that uh, there was a decrease in sudden cardiac death that in those patients that were taking amiodarone. From these two largest randomized studies, 
that uh, the take that uh, we currently that uh, have been following uh, with these two results is that we believe uh, then uh, I think these are the information that you should keep in mind uh, should there be questions related to this uh, particular issue is that amiodarone is not associated with increased mortality as the CAST study for flaconent anconite and mericicine. But there is no net benefit that in, for total mortality there may be some benefit for sudden cardiac death prevention. Therefore, we do not uniformly, we do not recommend to use amiodarone for sudden cardiac death, for uh, survival improvement in asymptomatic patients. But should a patient be very symptomatic from PVCs or non-sustained ventricular arrhythmias, then amiodarone, that perhaps is the drug of choice today in this particular patient population. Things got a little more even uh, confusion, confusing when it comes to the patients with compromised ejection fraction and heart failure patients. In other words, that these are not just the post-infarct patients. These are the patients that uh, with uh, compromised ejection fraction. Jessica's study was an Argentinian study, demonstrated that the total mortality actually was reduced when patients were treated with amiodarone as compared to placebo. Although that the American VA study, the CHF STAT study, that uh, showed no net benefit that in patients with heart failure taking amiodarone that compared to placebo. Again, that today that I would suggest that amiodarone is not recommended for prophylactic purposes for improving survival or to reduce sudden cardiac death. But should a drug be necessary that in these patients for PVC suppressions or non-sustained tachycardia suppressions because these patients are symptomatic, then amiodarone is the drug of choice. And how about sudden primary sudden cardiac death prevention that uh, for uh, primary uh, using devices? I do believe that some questions may come up because that the MADD study that was published in 1995 or 1996 in, in New England and the MUST study, which was the most recent study that supported the MADD study uh, results. So in other words, today we have more information to support that in selected patient population that uh, for primary sudden cardiac death prevention that we do have information to support one treatment versus the other. This was uh, the MUST study in, conducted in patients with myocardial infarction, compromised ejection fraction, meaning ejection fraction less than 40%. These patients were taken to the EP laboratory. If they had inducible ventricular tachycardia, they were randomized to no drug therapy, no antiarrhythmic drug therapy, which is the orange line, randomized to EP guided antiarrhythmic drug therapy, that's meaning that looking for VT suppression, and then randomized to ICD. The results were very convincing that in those patients with myocardial infarction, ejection fraction less than 40% with inducible VT. ICD improved survival significantly compared to placebo, compared to EP guided drug therapy. And these results, although the des study designs were a little bit different compared to the earlier MADD study, but the end results showing that in this particular selected patient population, ICD therapy is the drug, uh, uh, is the ther therapeutic choice that's for these patients. So that comes to the fourth guidelines today that for class one indication of ICD implantation. These are the non-sustained VT with coronary disease, prior myocardial infarction, ejection fraction less than 40% with inducible VF or sustained VT in the laboratory and uh, that not suppressed by the uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy, although I anticipate that the language of this particular criterion will change in the next version uh, uh, for ICD implantation. So that uh, 
for although that uh, it is a very much evolving practice today, but when it comes to primary sudden cardiac death prevention, it is key, key to keep in mind there is very limited value for prophylactic antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And actually, anything other than amiodarone therapy would be contraindicated. That, uh, and amiodarone should only be considered in those patients symptomatic and you think that PVC suppression may be beneficial for those symptoms of those patients. Survival benefit from ICD has been demonstrated in selected high-risk patients and indication for ICD implantation continues to evolve and of course cost will always be a major issue. So to summarize, the therapeutic uh, arena today for tachyarrhythmias when it comes to supraventricular arrhythmia, although that uh, we, uh, you know, didn't go into the ablation-related issues, and uh, you you will see them that uh, in the chapter, is that today for symptomatic patients with recurrent symptoms refractory to medical therapy, ablation therapy really is the most effective and the therapeutic choice for AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and AV reentrant AV reentrant tachycardia in those patients with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And uh, the typical type of atrial flutter that uh, also that today we can ablate these patients with better than 90% success rate. While pharmacological therapy that uh, is still that uh, the mainstream for atrial fibrillation, devices are very limited for atrial or supraventricular arrhythmias that surgery again that uh, today is really no longer used for most of the arrhythmia th for arrhythmic therapy. And while that for ventricular tachyarrhythmias, I would say that clinically speaking, for most of the arrhythmias, are ventricular arrhythmias occurring in patients with diseased hearts, that uh, ICD therapy is the treatment of choice. Question one. A 72-year-old female presented to your office after an episode of syncope complicated by slight head contusion. The episode occurred in the upright position with minimal warning. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension and myocardial infarction six months ago. Cardiovascular exam was unremarkable except for a grade one systolic ejection murmur at the aortic root and a brewy heard over both carotids. Which of the following evaluations would be contraindicated? Answer one, orthostatic blood pressure checks for orthostatic hypotension. Two, Holter monitoring for intermittent heart block. Three, carotid sinus massage for carotid sinus hypersensitivity. Four, tilt table testing for vasovagal response. Five, electrophysiologic study for inducible arrhythmias. Correct answer is number three, carotid sinus massage for carotid sinus hypersensitivity. Yes, uh, kind of a, a, a trick question. And here there is a clear contraindication and as versus uh, the, ther the diagnostic choices for the others, just depending upon the patient profile. And uh, what I have listed the answers, for instance, one of the possible uh, cause for this person's uh, symptom is uh, uh, orthostatic intolerance and therefore orthostatic blood pressure should be checked and there isn't really any contraindications for doing that. And Holter monitoring for intermittent heart block, that's clearly that's, uh, something to consider that uh, should you get additional history about the frequency. What's really contraindicated here is that the person that and carotid sinus uh, uh, hypersensitivity is one of the differential diagnoses in patients that with syncope. But the contraindications and the diagnosis is established by doing a carotid sinus massage. But the contraindications that in patients that with syncope for carotid sinus massage are those patients that uh, with a carotid buoy and or those patients who has had a prior history of TIAs or CVAs. And uh, again, tilt table testing for vasovagal syncope and electrophysiologic study for cardiogenic syncope. These are the possible diagnostic tools that we have for syncope evaluation. So the contraindication here is key in on some of the information provided to you in the, in the uh, background information and so then the answer should be fairly clear. Question two. 
A 58-year-old male has coronary artery disease and a history of myocardial infarction two years ago. He's currently taking one aspirin a day. During a routine annual exam, he complains of infrequent awareness of irregular heartbeats. He denies any symptoms of syncope or presyncope. Clinically, the patient is very active without any symptoms of angina or congestive heart failure. During his current evaluation, an exercise echo showed resting ejection fraction of 50% and presence of inferior akinesis. He exercised nine minutes on a Bruce protocol. There was no additional regional wall motion abnormality. The ejection fraction increased to 60% at peak exercise. A 24-hour Holter monitor showed six PVCs per hour with two runs of non-sustained VT up to four beats in duration. What would be the most appropriate approach? Answer one, amiodarone, 200 milligrams once a day. Two, atenolol, 50 milligrams once a day. Three, propofenone, 150 milligrams Q8H. Four, consider electrophysiologic study and electrophysiology study guided therapy. Five, consider ICD implantation. The correct answer is number two, atenolol, 50 milligrams once a day. Uh, is, uh, uh, I think, an area that's uh, very important. First, that uh, in the question, this person that has coronary artery disease and uh, with PVCs and two runs of non-sustained VT. Other important information to assist you in making the decision is his current ejection fraction and ischemic condition. His ejection fraction is 50%, and uh, he does not have any ischemic symptoms, or he did not have any evidence for ischemia by the good exercise function and also echocardiographic response during treadmills. So he is a person with uh, a stable coronary artery disease, minimally or asymptomatic PVCs and infrequent non-sustained VT with preserved ejection fraction. These are uh, the patients uh, at very low risk for sudden cardiac death. Remember all of the trials that included patients with ejection fraction of less than 40%. So in this particular patient, your target should be treating his underlying heart disease. There is no reason for ICD implantation. There is no indication for an EP study. Should the patient become symptomatic, in other words, the person has had syncope or presyncope, then that's a different ballgame. But this is an asymptomatic patient with preserved ejection fraction in the setting of a stable coronary artery disease. No ICD, no EP study is indicated. While, as I said earlier, that amiodarone, although or is considered one of the choices that in patients with underlying heart disease should you decide to suppress PVCs, but again, in an asymptomatic patient, I would not use amiodarone to suppress asymptomatic PVCs or non-sustained VT. So therefore, the best choice that out of this group would be a beta blocker therapy. Question three. A 64-year-old female was in the ER for treatment of acute inferior wall MI. During thrombolytic therapy, she had a transient episode of bradycardia with stable hemodynamics. A 12-lead ECG during the bradycardia is shown in the figure. The entire episode lasted for 20 minutes. Her subsequent hospital course was uneventful. A 12-lead ECG on post-myocardial infarction day three showed sinus bradycardia at a rate of 54 beats per minute. PR, QRS, and QT intervals were normal, while the ST segments in the inferior leads were normalizing. Which of the following recommendations would be most appropriate for the transient episode of bradycardia? 
Answer one, permanent pacemaker implantation. Two, electrophysiologic study. Three, treadmill exercise test. Four, Holter monitoring. Five, continual observation. The correct answer is number five, continual observation. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move right on to question four. A 71-year-old male has a history of hypertension and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, currently on digoxin, quinaglute, diazide, and coumadin. Due to frequent recurrences of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you have recommended that he discontinue quinidine and start amiodarone therapy. It is anticipated which of the following adjustments will be most likely required? Answer one, lower Coumadin dosage. Two, discontinue diazide. Three, discontinue digoxin. Four, lower digoxin dose. Five, no adjustment anticipated. The correct answer is number one, lower Coumadin dose. Another trick question here that uh, remember the interaction of quinidine and digoxin and also the interaction of amiodarone with digoxin and coumadin. Because the fact that quinidine elevates the digoxin level, amiodarone also elevates the digoxin level. So when the drug is switched from quinidine to amiodarone, it would not be anticipated that digoxin dosage needs to be adjusted, while, of course, because of the interaction of amiodarone with coumadin, that it is very much that the coumadin usually needs to be dropped by about, uh, to, dropped by one-third of the initial dose to one-half. Question five. A 45-year-old male has idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy and compensated congestive heart failure. Functionally, he is class two. A recent echocardiogram demonstrated an ejection fraction of 30%. The patient is currently taking digoxin and diuretics. Because of symptoms of palpitations, a Holter monitor was obtained. This demonstrated 22,000 PVCs over 24 hours. There were four runs of non-sustained VT, up to six beats in duration. All of the following statements are correct, except answer one, beta blocker therapy reduces mortality in this patient population. Two, ICD improves survival. Three, electrophysiologic study and electrophysiologic study guided therapy for sudden cardiac death prevention is not useful. Four, amiodarone suppresses PVCs and may improve ejection fraction. Five, ACE inhibitor therapy reduces mortality. The correct answer is number two, ICD improves survival. A 76-year-old female has a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in the setting of hypertension. She continues to have symptomatic episodes of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation despite adequate control of blood pressure with an ACE inhibitor and diuretics. Physical exam was unremarkable. Lab testing showed a normal electrocardiogram and a normal ejection fraction by echocardiogram. Blood tests showed normal CBC and chemistry group except for a creatinine of 2.1. You are contemplating starting antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Significant dose adjustment is expected with which of the following drugs? Answer one, amiodarone. Two, sotalol. Three, procainamid. Four, quinidine. Five, flecainide. The correct answer is number two, sotalol. Most of you got that correct, so let's move on to question seven. A 30-year-old female school bus driver was evaluated in the emergency room for palpitations and presyncope. A 12-lead electrocardiogram is shown in figure A and above. During physical exam, the tachycardia spontaneously terminated. A subsequent electrocardiogram following tachycardia termination is shown in figure B. 
What would be the most appropriate recommendation at this time? Answer one, routine follow-up for recurrence, since this was the patient's first clinical event. Two, consider a trial of digoxin therapy. Three, refer patient for electrophysiologic study and ablation. Four, consider a course of amiodarone therapy. Five, consider a course of beta blocker therapy. The correct answer is number three, refer patient for electrophysiologic study and ablation. Very good, let's move on to question eight. A 65-year-old farmer has a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation slash atrial flutter. At baseline, while in atrial flutter, a 12-lead ECG is shown in figure A and above. His rhythm was controlled on propofenone, 300 milligrams every eight hours, until three months later when he experienced recurrent palpitations and lightheadedness. He was evaluated in the emergency room. On exam, he was uncomfortable but hemodynamically stable. A 12-lead ECG showed a wide complex tachycardia, as in figure B and above. What is the rhythm diagnosis? Answer one, ventricular tachycardia. Two, atrial flutter with ventricular conduction delay. Three, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia with ventricular conduction delay. Four, atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia with conduction delay. Five, sinus tachycardia with con conduction delay. The correct answer is number two, atrial flutter with ventricular conduction delay. Another tough one. Atrial, uh, when propofenone, which is a class 1C drug, is used, and the two proarrhythmic uh, areas that uh, we should keep in mind. One is the possibility of induced VT, as I see that uh, the answer is on the board as uh, the first choice, or that uh, while that the propofenone is on board, then uh, there is a tendency of uh, faster AV nodal conduction, and therefore that promotes one-to-one -one AV conduction rapid ventricular rate, and because class 1C drug is a sodium channel blocker, it uh, therefore affects uh, the QRS duration at a faster ventricular rate that uh, the QRS duration that even can be even prolonged. So essentially that the choice, the choice will be between either ventricular tachycardia versus rapid AV conduction with one-to-one -one and intraventricular conduction delay in the setting of profile. How do you differentiate the two? The, it's very difficult and there are frequently no absolute ECG criteria that to really differentiate one proarrhythmia versus the other. But if we look at two, two areas that perhaps can help us to make a decision, one is that the rate of the tachycardia appears to be very much similar or identical to the flutter rate should the flutter go to one to one. The other piece of information is that in the setting, in a person in the absence of any disease, underlying prior infarct and what have you, the incidences of uh, proarrhythmia that's a secondary to propofenone resulting into VT is less than the rapid ventricular rate and uh, widened QS complex or intraventricular conduction delay. So the correct answer here is two, that rapid ventricular rate and with ventricular conduction delay. And although, as I said, that the really two possibilities is either VT, as what most of you have picked, or number two. But I would make the decision by concentrating on the rate of the tachycardia and comparing to the flood rates. Let's move on to question nine. A 30-year-old male has a history of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, terminable with adenosine. What is the most likely mechanism underlying the adenosine-mediated therapeutic effect? 
Answer one, blockade in the accessory pathway. Two, blockade in the AV node. Three, blockade in the sinus node. Four, blockade in the atrial tissue. Five, blockade in the ventricular tissue. The correct answer is number two, blockade in the AV node. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move directly on to question 10. A 17-year-old girl suddenly collapses while running track. Upon paramedic arrival, she was found to be in ventricular fibrillation. Defibrillation was successful. A 12-lead electrocardiogram on admission is shown here. During the first hour on the cardiac monitoring in the CCU, several episodes of non-sustained polymorphic VT were observed. Um, part one, all of the following acute interventions would be appropriate except answer one, potassium supplement, two, magnesium supplement, three, isoproterenol infusion, four, esmolol infusion, five, continuous blood pressure monitoring. The correct answer is number three, isoproterenol infusion. Most of you got that correct, so we'll go to part two of this question. What is the most appropriate therapeutic 